Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, waiting a couple of minutes while we uh, got some technical things sorted out. Uh, we're excited to have you here for our rescheduled NTC presentation on stop redesigning your organization's website and start evolving it. Uh, we're going to wait just another minute or two to let some uh, late rolling folks uh, roll in the door and then we'll get started. All right, looks like we got a solid number of people that have uh, made it into the webinar at this point. So I think we may just get started and uh, probably some other folks will join in as if they can. Uh, I wanted to thank you all for attending this today. I really appreciate you coming. My name is Ben Byrne. Uh, I'm one of the three founders of Corner Shop Creative. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you today about um, sort of a different way to think about um, keeping your web presence up to date um, with rather than going through this sort of heavy redesign process, uh, every couple of years, uh, making more gradual improvements. Um, Co-presenting with me today is Allison Hinchman. Uh, she's with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, Alice, do you want to say a word about yourself? Uh, yeah, can folks hear me? I can hear you, all right. Okay, good. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, sorry, we had some uh, work from home difficulties this morning or this afternoon. Uh, I am the Director of Digital Engagement and Acquisition at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I've worked at the National Trust for a long time, um, but I've been in our marketing division for eight or nine years. And I'm going to talk about our experience um, with our website, savingplaces.org. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. So um, just a little bit about myself and Corner Shop Creative. Uh, we're a nonprofit serving uh, digital services agency. We do website redesigns, data integrations, um, fundraising, campaign implementation, all that kind of stuff. Um, but obviously today we're here to talk about the website redesign stuff. So uh, I think the way this is gonna go is I'm gonna spend the first part of the presentation here uh, talking about the theory and uh, what this idea is and what some of the pros and cons of it might be. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Allison to talk about sort of her experiences from the nonprofit side actually taking this approach. Um, what does that look like? Um, what have some of the challenges been and that sort of thing? Uh, and then we will try to have uh, some time for Q&A at the end uh, to go over questions you have for either one of us. So to get started, uh, I want to talk just a little bit about this, this concept. Um, I, I've heard it called a number of different things. Um, iterative web design seems to be one of the most common things uh, if you try to Google around for this. Um, but you might hear people talk about like incremental web design enhancements um, or gradual updates or something like that. Um, but uh, I like iterative the most as sort of the idea because it sort of suggests that the process is, is cyclical um, rather, rather than just sort of a gradual accretion um, that you are sort of turning back and reviewing and maybe changing things you've already done. Um, so the idea here is that, you know, rather than, you know, every five years or however long it is, um, you know, you jumping in and, you know, hiring an agency and reviewing everything on your site from scratch and maybe your branding and, you know, complete redesign, um, that you bite off specific chunks of your website from time to time. Um, and to, to like concentrate on one thing, like maybe you're going to redo, um, you know, the nav bar at the top of your homepage, then maybe you'll like re-architect the press room area of your website, or maybe then you'll add a new content type, uh, or redo your footer, or maybe you even have like a rebranding where you just want to like change your logo and some colors, but not the whole site design. Um, but the idea is, is that you're, you're focusing on different smaller chunks of the site rather than redoing the entire site. Um, and so the question is, why would you want to do it that way? Um, so the basic idea here is that um, for doing a whole site redesign, um, there are actually a lot of sort of disadvantages to that process, um, despite the fact that it's a way that a lot of us have done things for a long time. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about sort of one of, what are those sort of problems with this idea of doing a redesign every couple of years. Uh, and when I say couple, you know, depending on your organization budget and size, 
that might be every two or three, that might be every 10 to 12, you know, depending on sort of what your budget is and how much attention you pay your website. But uh, it's still this idea of redoing the whole site, right? So um, the thing here, one of the things here is this idea of user disruption um, that, you know, it, it, particularly for um, site visitors who maybe visit your site regularly, um, you know, you're really, you're really active supporters or maybe journalists who cover your issue or something like that. Um, you know, they're used to your site looking in a certain way and can actually be very disruptive to them, you know, to wake up one morning and sit down at their computer and go visit your site, you know, or maybe they have like a, you know, a resources landing page on your site bookmark somewhere uh, and go visit it and have it look completely different. Um, you know, and be like, oh my gosh, is this like, is this the same organization? Did I mistype the URL? You know, do you have, you know, is there a word where I put two T's instead of one? Or like, uh, it could just be, it can be very disrupting to your users to simply not know where to go to find things because they used to know, oh, it was three clicks away on the sidebar uh, and that sort of thing. Um, that it's just, it, it can create a lot of confusion. Uh, the metaphor or example I like to use here is um, thinking of a site like Facebook or Twitter. Um, that, you know, for the most part, you know, if you were to actually get a screenshot of Facebook from five years ago or seven years ago or whatever, um, it would look actually quite different than it looks today. Um, I mean, some of the basics would be the same in terms of the blue bar at the top and the main feed, um, but they're sort of constantly adding little features or changing little behaviors. You know, one day you logged in and there were suddenly more rounded corners or the emoji reactions they didn't used to have. Um, but what they're doing is they're not just like throwing out the whole site and like giving you a whole new thing. Uh, it's just little bits and pieces here and there are changing over time. And it's much easier for an end user to get accustomed to one little new thing than it is for a user to get accustomed to a whole new universe. Um, and so it really can sort of slow your users down, make it harder for them to find things. You know, we're all creatures of habit. Um, and so it can be very, very disruptive and disorienting to like just drift through everything out. So it's bad for your users. Uh, it can also come with um, SEO ramifications. Uh, so if you're spending a lot of time uh, on your site, making sure that you're doing well in search engines and you know, conforming to some basic best practices and that sort of stuff. Um, when you redesign, um, you can wind up you know, changing a lot of URLs and changing a lot of link patterns and stuff like that. Uh, and that can be very disruptive to your SEO. Um, there are ways to mitigate that. Um, if as a part of your redesign, you're working closely with an SEO firm or you know, your team or whoever who knows the stuff well, um, you, know, you can do things in terms of setting up redirects um, and you know, all of that kind of stuff to try to mitigate that SEO hit when you launch the new site. Um, but it's, it's a mitigation factor. It's still, you know, it's not sort of necessarily protecting you from everything bad that might happen. Uh, you know, for a lot of our clients, we talk about like, you know, when you launch your new site, don't expect your traffic to go way up right away necessarily. It might actually be a month or some, some stretch of time before your site sort of recovers in terms of search engine spidering and all that kind of stuff, even if you're doing the best practices. Um, of course, if your current site, if your old site, if one of the reasons you're redesigning your site is because the old site had terrible SEO and you're not showing up in any search engines or not getting sort of what you want to be getting, you know, maybe this is not such a huge concern. Um, you know, if that's one of your motivating factors is your, your site doesn't have good architecture, doesn't support thing, you know, SEO best practices, um, you know, maybe you don't need to worry so much about this because you've only got one way to go and that's up. Um, but it, this, this can be a negative thing for a site that's performing well in SEO if you do a complete redesign um, for the search spiders to catch everything up and give you good scores again and all that kind of stuff. Um, another big pitfall with uh, a maid going through a major redesign process is just making sure you have the capacity to do it uh, and the capacity to maintain your existing site while you're going through this process. Uh, you know, if you think about your website as being the epicenter of all of the work your, your organization does, whether it's email marketing, print pieces with URLs on them, webinars you might host, um, physical events you might host, you know, your social media accounts, um, all of those things, even when you're going through a redesign, they're still happening. Um, you know, it's not like all of those are going to like quiet down for like the last month while you push to get the new website out. 
Um, they need to keep moving along. They need to be successful. Um, but, you know, especially if you're a smaller staff, um, you know, you're, you know, as the communications director, whoever's leading, leading, excuse me, the redesign process, um, a lot of your time and energy is probably being focused on retooling content for the new site. Um, you know, making sure you've got that SEO stuff figured out and like you're working with your agency or whoever to do the redesign. Um, and so suddenly you're basically, you know, whether it's an individual or a team, you've basically got two websites you're managing at the same time. You've got the old one and the new one, even if the new one hasn't launched yet. Um, and, you know, really, it, typically the new one is much more exciting. Um, it's cool. You want it to be perfect. Um, that the old website uh, that you're going to be disregarding soon actually tends to languish a little bit. Um, and, you know, there's not as much, maybe as much enthusiasm to keep having to do things the old and clunky way when you know this new, fresh new way is right around the corner. Um, but that can actually sort of, both sites can suffer for this. If you're spread too thin, if you don't have time, um, you know, you're trying to maintain one while, you know, providing guidance on the other. Um, they can both suffer unless you have capacity to sort of do this and, you know, you've carved out time and space. Um, it, it's a real challenge. Uh, another big problem with redesigns is the idea of making uninformed decisions. Um, so this is the fact that uh, if you're redesigning an entire site and all aspects of it and that sort of thing, um, while you can go through a bunch of sort of testing processes, um, you know, user testing, performance testing, you know, card sorts with, you know, would-be users and that sort of stuff to try to guarantee that your new nav is going to make sense to your users or your users going to find things in two clicks. Um, you know, all that sort of stuff. You should be doing that as a part of a redesign. If your budget can possibly afford it, um, you want to be doing that user testing so that you know that what you're going to launch with is sort of better than the old stuff. Um, but you can never really know um, until the site is live. You're still sort of making educated guesses, um, particularly for you know, some of those early process things like design reviews um, or card sorts where you're having potential users try to organize your content for you. Um, you know, they may not be representative or you know, the people running through the tests are a small sample of a much larger audience you've got. And you hope they're a representative sample, but maybe they're not. Um, and so you're basically, you're sitting there, you know, making decisions about, you know, whether you like something a certain way or not a certain way, or you prefer that blue to that green. Um, but they're, they're not informed decisions, you know, they're, they're based on your best guess of what your audience likes, or you're, they're based on a small bit of user testing. Um, you never really know until you go live. Um, and this is, can be an advantage, as I'll talk more about, um, of the incrementalist sort of approach is that you can actually deploy a new thing and see how people react to it and gather real data from real users and then respond to it. Um, the last sort of big pitfall I would say about a major redesign project um, is just um, the high stakes of it. Uh, when you're going through this sort of sequential waterfall process um, with your agency or again internally to like build out this new site, you spend all of this time and all of this energy, you know, doing you know, discovery and wireframes and designs and revisions and content entry and content migration and all that kind of stuff. You know, depending on your organization budget, maybe this is, you know, a $10,000 project, maybe it's a $100,000 project. Um, but you're spending a lot of money and it sort of, it starts to feel like, oh my gosh, we spent all this money, we better get it right. Uh, and it starts to, it turns into this huge risk of like, what if you didn't get it right? Um, you know, what if something was off despite all of the sort of smart decisions you tried to make with user testing or whatever it was, um, maybe something is wrong. Um, or maybe because you're working on so many things, you're trying to address so many problems, you're trying to get donations to go up, you're trying to get email listservs to go up, you're trying to get clicks to go down and visits to go up, and you're trying to address like 10 problems all at once. Um, success can be really hard to define. Maybe you don't even know if you got it right or not because there's so many moving parts. It's impossible to know, well, did this go up or down because of the redesign or because of something else? Or like maybe we fixed four problems, but we made six problems worse. Um, was that a success or not? It gets sort of really hard to tell when you're sort of addressing so many factors at once through a major redesign. Um, so this is why we sort of um, have started thinking about this iterative approach as an alternative to the major redesign. Um, and so with this alternative approach where you work on little chunks and evolve your site over time, 
um, there are some advantages to this. Um, one of them, uh, sort of the flip side of what we were talking about before, um, is smaller changes means less disruption to your users. Uh, it also tends to mean less disruption to your SEO. Uh, you know, you may be reorganizing some content in your site, like in the press room or the resource library or something. Um, but because you're not redoing the whole site, um, you know, the nav isn't completely changing and everything is in a new place and everything's URL is into a new place. Um, you know, maybe you've tweaked some colors or your button sizes are bigger or now your buttons are red because you're trying to get your click-through rates higher on your calls to action. Um, it's just less, less disruptive. Um, you know, parts, there's a lot more familiarity there, that equity you've built uh, with your users who know and understand your site and your content. Um, you haven't jeopardized all of it. You've just sort of fiddled with a portion of it. And that can be really good. Another advantage is that you can make more informed decisions uh, about the changes you're making. Um, you know, if you're changing fewer variables, if you're, you know, it's like, hey, we're just trying to get, you know, the click-through rate on our primary call to action on our homepage higher. Um, you're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You're just messing with that one part of your site. You can experiment. You can say, okay, what if we make the button red instead of our normal on ramp purple? Or what if we make the button bigger? Or what if we move it up? And you can experiment with just sort of that, that one variable or that one thing and observe over time if it's working or not working uh, and then sort of base your decision on that. And you can roll it back if it didn't work. You can continue to evolve it if you can get better. Uh, but the, uh, the basic idea here is you think about like the scientific process. Um, you, know, you try to control as many things as you can control and then just vary one thing so that you can figure out if that one thing makes a difference. Uh, when you do a full website redesign, you don't have any controls. You basically varied everything. And so it's very hard to tease out the like, what, you know, what change on the site led to this improvement or to this decrease. Um, if you do it iterative, you change one thing at a time, you've only got one variable or a couple of small variables, it's much easier to identify what effect any given particular change has had. Another advantage of a more incrementalist approach is that instead of having a big budget, um, you know, and sort of spending it all at once in one big project, uh, and that big budget can be very scary, especially if you hit unexpected problems or your requirements shift or something like that, where suddenly that big budget needs to be 20% bigger uh, and things get scary because you have to reevaluate and try to find more money. Um, if you take a, a more incrementalist approach, um, you can sort of spread that out and just allocate maybe a fairly consistent amount of money and staff resources um, on a consistent ongoing basis. Maybe you spend a little bit more during, you know, like end of year fundraising time or something like that. But, you know, you can sort of spread that out and having it all, rather than all crescendo with the site launch and one vendor and like your whole team being super stressed out and working long hours, um, you can just budget. Like everybody, you know, we're gonna put in 20 hours a month, give or take, uh, and slowly evolve different pieces and parts and components. Um, and so you, you don't get surprised by this 20% overage or this delayed launch date that screws everything up or that sort of thing. Uh, and actually, it can be much easier to manage uh, a more predictable thing like this. Uh, of course, there are some disadvantages to that from a budgeting standpoint, too, that I'll talk about. Um, again, flip side of the risk inherent with a major redesign um, is that you're taking less risk. Um, because you're taking changes in smaller chunks. Uh, and when there's smaller changes, smaller risk, um, that means that there's also less reward for each change. And it's like, oh, all we've done is increased our click-through rate on the homepage. Um, but because you're changing fewer and fewer things at a time and you can measure those results, uh, you can sort of over time, even though you've only changed one thing this month and maybe one thing next month, um, at the end of the year, you can say, hey, we changed these 12 things. We measured the effect of each of them. We know each of them worked. Um, and so being able at work time to actually itemize out lots of these little wins for these little risks you took um, may actually at the end of the year uh, give you a, like a more compelling portfolio to share with your board or your leadership uh, than one sort of big, bushy, like, our site looks better um, sort of win. Um, of course, this incremental approach um, does have a number of challenges, and Allison will talk uh, more about some of them organizationally uh, in the real world. But um, 
sort of philosophically, there are a couple ones uh, that can make uh, this sort of incremental approach very difficult. Um, one of them is just this paradigm shift in, in culture and budgeting. Um, right, that if your team is not used to working this way, uh, and whether that team means, you know, the leadership of your organization, your communications team, your development team, or your funders, um, or your technology partner, uh, who might be doing this sort of work or doing the redesigns with you, um, this can be a challenge for them to wrap their brains around and get on board with. Um, you know, to, to tell the leadership, we're never going to redesign our site again. Um, we're going to do this incremental thing. You know, it it takes some getting used to, uh, and particularly like um, with funders. You know, if you're used to like trying to get a grant to specifically redesign your whole website every five years or whatever, you have sort of established rhythm with that. Um, it might be tough to like try to work with funders or your funding stream to say, no, we're going to take this other approach. We're just going to gradually work on things. Um, that's a challenge. Um, you know, you you need to figure out how to persuade people both internally and externally. Um, that this is the way you want to do it um, and make sure that people are comfortable and going to be on board doing it that way um, because you're going to need their buy-in over time for it to be successful. Another thing is you need the right team. Um, so whether you're relying heavily on an external partner um, that does your marketing and tech or something like that or you've got you know in-house developers or whatever, you're going to need a team in place that has the skills um, not just to build website stuff like you might do with a redesign, um, but it actually has the skills and the knowledge to test the results of those things. Um, you know, if you're, if you're really doing full iterative, um, where you're reviewing the success of any given change you're making, um, you need a team that doesn't just know how to build things, but you need a team that knows how to collect that data and review it and make informed decisions about it. Uh, and that's different, um, you know, spending that time to look at your data and review it and understand it and know sort of before and after what's good and what's bad. Uh, that's a different skill set than just being able to like write HTML and JavaScript and create something new and cool. So you need to make sure you've got the right pieces in place to sort of do it intelligently. And then, of course, uh, the other major thing you need is the right platform and tools to make this happen. Um, so one of these things is like your content management system needs to be flexible enough to support this. Uh, you know, if you're on some sort of proprietary solution where you can't change certain things um, or a lot of things, it might be very difficult to sort of, you know, iterate over the things you want to experiment with, uh, whether that's your nav or your branding or whatever it is, um, or adding new features, you know, maybe you just can't add a map because of the tool you're on. Um, so you need to make sure you're on a platform that's amenable to this approach. Um, we're a WordPress shop for the most part. Uh, we think WordPress is very amenable to this. Um, you know, it changes over time. It's also very amenable to constant tinkering and changes over time. Um, if you're on a platform uh, like Drupal, you can do a good chunk of this. Uh, although like Drupal does tend to put its major releases to sort of force you to almost do a redesign process because the code base is not backward compatible. Um, you know, it just sort of depends, you know, you may have a homegrown CMS you're working on and that might be amenable to this and it might not, but you need to make sure you've got a tool that's going to give you the flexibility to make the changes you might want to change or make over time. Um, you're also going to need um, to make sure you've got tools to allow you to gather the data you want to gather. Um, so one of the biggest things for this is an A-B testing tool. You may be familiar with A-B testing for things like email marketing, um, where you have to, you know, you, you test out a subject line or some content or a call to action in the message and gather from 10% of your people and then choose the one that's more successful. Um, that A-B testing approach is something you can do with web design, but you need a, you need a tool that integrates with your site to do that. Um, Optimizely is one, Google Optimize is another. Um, there are several out there, but you will need an A-B testing tool if you wanna make some of these data informed decisions. Um, similarly, you will need something that's doing sort of data tracking. Um, Google Analytics is the default these days for most people. Um, you might have something else in place. It doesn't really necessarily matter what it is. You just need to make sure that you're able to gather and track the data that you're looking to affect. Um, and so you need to have a tool for that. Those are some of the sort of challenges. Um, obviously, I, uh, you know, there are others, but these are sort of the major three. If you're you know, serious about thinking about switching to this sort of approach, this would be um, some things to keep in mind that you're going to have to figure out before you actually try to make this approach. 
Um, but I've been talking theory here um, and not really um, what it's like in practice to be running an organization that's taking this approach. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand it over to Allison. We're going to stop my screen sharing and hopefully she can get hers up and running. And she's going to sort of walk you through what it's been like at the National Trust to sort of live this uh, iterative like life. All right. It says I cannot start screen share while Ben is still sharing. Wait, wait. Uh... All right, can you all hear me? Ben, can you hear me? I and can, can you, you see my screen? Things look good here too. Okay, great. <laughs> um, thank you. It's my first time trying to uh, be a presenter on Zoom, so that's exciting. Uh, as I said, I'm the Director of Digital Engagement at the National Trust. And I'm going to talk about primarily savingplaces.org, which is our main website. A little bit of background. It was last redesigned um, and launched in October of 2015. <clears throat> and I would say that in the normal course of things, we would probably be thinking right about now about whether we wanted to redesign. Um, so we've, we've had it for um, a good long time. Um, and it is built, it's a custom CMS built in Ruby on Rails, which is a little bit unusual. And we work with, uh, primarily with a firm in Falls Church, Virginia um, called Bigot Labs. But you'll also hear me talk a little bit about working with um, some of our experience with Corner Shop because they do help us on a bunch of WordPress sites. So let's see if I can do this correctly. Um, so this is our website. This is our homepage and it's, we have, we make changes almost every month to the website. It's a little bit hard to capture that in a slide, but this is our homepage. And among the elements that were not part of this website when we launched were in the upper right hand corner, the donate, renew and join buttons. And this bar of three cards below the hero image we call this our synopsis, that's relatively new. Um, and we have also relabeled the top level navigation several times. Ben uh, talked a little bit about leadership support and the internal optics. Uh, we just re relabeled those navigation buckets in January and prior to doing that, our executive team insisted on referring to it as a website redesign, even though all we were doing was uh, relabeling the navigation. <coughs> so um, that was uh, an interesting experience for me. So when it works, the most important part from my point of view is making sure that you have a really good technology partner. So what I mean by a technology partner is you don't wanna just hire, issue an RFP, hire a vendor, they deliver the website and they walk away. They send you an invoice and they walk away. And anytime that you need to do something, it's a whole process and you can't get them to pay attention. Um, if you have a partner, they'll stick with you. They'll learn about your organization. They'll complement any of your internal strengths and weaknesses. Um, and They'll be interested in your success, not just completion of the job. We have no internal technology um, folks, no programmers. I know a little bit of everything, kind of enough to break things, but I'm really not a programmer. So we wholly rely on our external partners to do anything for websites. Um, and we trust them to be experts and provide advice, not just execute on a task that we set before them. One of the things that I've learned is that you should never ask a programmer if something is possible because they will always say yes. The question is whether it's advisable. So um, a good partner knows how to tell you those sorts of things. The other important thing is having stability on both the client and the partner side. I said vendor here, partner side. Uh, if you have a partner, you want to be able to maintain a shared vision. And that comes down 
to some extent to stability in people. If you have high turnover and you have a lot of egos who want to put their stamp on things, doing it the iterative way won't work. Everyone's going to want to change things every time. Uh, as the Vigit staff has changed, there's been enough overlap to keep it consistent. And Corner Shop is a incredibly um, stable and consistent company. I don't know if anyone's left. Uh, and on our side, the National Trust staff did not change for five years. We had um, our Vice President for Marketing left recently, so that's a big change for me. He was my uh, primary internal advocate, but our current content, uh, our current Chief Marketing Officer is also a great advocate. I think that programmer changes is one of the biggest risks since code can be a little bit idiosyncratic. If you have a really big change in programmer, they, the vendor will tell you that you have to redesign the site because they will not know how the programming of your custom site works. That's a really big um, drawback to using something like Ruby on Rails that is custom because it's complicated and expensive to leave your vendor and try to find someone new who will know kind of what's going on. Uh, so both Ben and I have already mentioned getting support from leadership. We've had mostly at mid-level stability, we have had four or five chief marketing officers and have been lucky enough that they were all okay with the website, felt that it reflected the brand, were not eager to relaunch. I would say that our uh, contracting has been a bigger issue. Multi-year contracts add up. And we have some internal business rules that trigger um, a required RFP, RFP if we have spent too much money with a given vendor. So um, it, it's silly to me to redesign a website just because you've paid someone, you've worked with someone for too long. Um, it's not really how the internet should work, but we have to work that through with our uh, legal team every couple years. It also helps that I know how much I'm budgeted for the year and roughly what that is per month. So I can pace my spend more or less over the year. And um, I like to spend the majority of it in the first three quarters of the year. I work at a nonprofit, you guys do too. The fourth quarter of the year is when stuff always gets cut to meet budget. So I tend to kind of front load some of my projects. Um, the next thing is keeping a wish list or a roadmap. <coughs> Pardon me. So maybe an idea hits you when you're trying to build a specific page. It's too late for whatever that page is, um, but write it down. Remember that idea. You can do it in Google Doc, Excel. Right now we're using Airtable, which is kind of a smart sheet version online. Uh, we also use Basecamp and Slack to communicate and track items. And on a regular basis, we are reassessing priorities and level of effort um, with our technology partner. Uh, we do bi-weekly check-ins, but it can be more or less often. And that's just constantly looking at where are we on the budget? What campaigns do we have coming up? So are there, is there new functionality or changes that we really need to happen by that campaign? Is there something that was low priority that we have a really good idea, we want to use it, so it's more important? Is there something that I thought would be really easy, but it's actually really, really hard, so we shouldn't do it, we'll push that down. Um, it's, it's a low priority and it's a high level of effort, so we won't do it, or vice versa, something that Maybe it's low priority, but it's actually really easy, so we can just go ahead and do it. So the other, um, the next item is, I'm sure everyone has heard this, that you can do something well, quickly, or cheaply, pick two. I would say if you're doing the iterative approach, you are generally choosing to do something well and affordably, but not quickly. The wish list that you're keeping helps you get ahead and anticipate future needs. You can get stuff done um, as you think of it um, and not 
wait until the campaign moment and have to rush, pay a rush rate to get something done. You want to be constantly building your wish list, um, even if it's an idea that's half formed, so that you're always staying ahead of things. I would say this also works best if you have not had a major brand redesign, especially logo and color changes. We recently tried to tweak the color palette online. We had a tweak to the overall brand palette. And even though we're using CSS and it's a compiled CSS, it turned out to be incredibly complicated to make the update online. And I talked to our director of creative services, who's our brand manager, and we decided that the changes were minor enough that we did not need to change it online. If it had been a major change, um, that would have been <laughs> really problematic. So the other thing that we do is we have a shared document for savingplaces.org and we update it regularly. It's CMS documentation. We have some standard operating procedures for a few complicated processes. In the Google Doc, I flag it when there's a major feature change. Sometimes I will make edits to clarify the documentation around how we work, but I will also authorize Vigit once or twice a year to spend some time updating the documentation so that it works for them and us. This is really important. We use it as a training document for new staff and uh, it also helps Vigit when they have new staff come on board, they can look at the documentation and learn how all of the different pieces are working. We have a few SOPs that we use. These are mostly when we have multiple systems that are interacting. Uh, one example, we use Engaging Networks as our email online fundraising and advocacy platform. And there are places where we can embed Engaging Networks into our CMS but it's a little bit complicated to do it. So we have some documentation for that. We also have a user generated content platform that is also built in Ruby on Rails. It's separately credentialed from the CMS. Uh, we, we call it kind of an app, um, but you can embed it directly in the CMS. Um, we have, because it's separately credentialed, we use a lot of reviewers for UGC campaigns and um, that needs a whole separate SOP because it is so different from the regular um, CMS. The other thing I would say is that it's really important to when you are making enhancements to think about the immediate need, but also try to be high level and forward thinking. We try always to think about other ways we might use it. If it's for a specific use case, how might we make it useful for that, but also flexible enough for another campaign? Sometimes it helps to think about a past campaign and how you might have used it for that. We like to start simple and add functionality as we need it so that we don't get locked into one development path for a specific need. I am almost always we try to build in defaults and fallbacks so that if something can be configured and someone forgets it, there's, it doesn't break anything. The end user always sees something. Um, that's true when we can configure colors, there's a default color, but we can also override it. Um, but we also trust our humans to follow the standard operating procedures and we lock down or automate only when we really have to. And I would say um, the other bonus, <coughs> pardon me, is that when the immediate future is uncertain, having, being on this iterative path is really helpful. I um, authorized a major enhancement to our website two weeks ago. It was work that was done in January and February. And right now we're kind of in a stop work because of the coronavirus epidemic. And I don't know when we'll go back to it um, because our, like many, our fundraising, everything is, is so uncertain right now. That's okay because we've been doing an iterative approach. We weren't 
waiting to make, we weren't working with a website that we hated and waiting for a major redesign next month to solve all our problems. We solve our problems as we hit them so that when we have a work stop for a month or two, we never fall that far behind. We're not stuck with a work set, with a website that doesn't work for us. So an iterative approach can really make your organization more resilient when, the, when external factors are quite uncertain. So here are a couple of things to think about um, for why thing why this might not work. <clears throat> I have a framework that I. Um, kind of mental framework that I use whenever someone in a meeting presents an idea and our knee-jerk reaction is, oh, we tried that once. Um, and I think it, it works here a little bit. So the questions that I try to ask when that happens is, have we changed, have they changed, and has the technology changed? And I use this to help me keep an open mind about um, trying old ideas again. So have we changed? Has your organization fundamentally changed? Have you had a major rebranding? Have you totally changed the way that you fulfill your mission? Have you changed your business or membership model? And has your capacity changed so that you can't support your website anymore? Those things might weigh in the, in the side of going forward with a redesign, a huge redesign. Another thing to think about is if your community, community or audience has changed, um, have your donor expectations changed? If you um, provide services, have your client expectations changed and you need a really fundamentally different kind of web presence in order to meet those needs. And then the other one is has the technology changed? So when we made the switch to our current CMS, we did it partly because we were frustrated with our old CMS and the barriers to making that website a fully mobile responsive website. We really decided that we would not be able to do it on our old CMS. The technology changed. Maybe you had a website that relied on Flash. I hope that's not true anymore. Um, and we also at one point had an old, had a website that was using an old branded URL and for technical reasons related to the URL, we couldn't switch it. So we ended up having to redesign the website just so that we could use a new URL. Um, and I think, I think those are my, those are my big items. Thank you, Allison. Um, I've seen one question through our chat panel here, um, and that was from Ashley earlier. I think it's more directed towards Ben. Um, for any attendees, if you haven't noticed yet, if you're not familiar with Zoom, there's a chat panel um, that uh, you can open up. There's a little chat bubble kind of at the bot bottom of the Zoom panel. Um, so if you click on that, you'll see some chat options. You can send questions our way. Um, so Ben, the question from Ashley is uh, just sort of wanting to hear more about iterative, iterative design um, because they're forced into a uh, Drupal upgrade redesign related to the Drupal upgrade. So um, if you have any case studies or example situations, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I would say there's a, there's a couple things to think about uh, in this context. I mean, you know, one of them is, you know, sometimes when you have to shift platforms because of, a, you know, a Drupal upgrade or something like that, you know, it is, you know, I'm not going to argue against the idea that it's an opportunity to maybe, you know, fix some long sending things that you've always hated uh, or, you know, you know, resolve some stuff that you, you know, that you would do in a major redesign. Um, that you know, you, you know isn't working for you and can't possibly get any worse kind of thing. Um, so you know, it, if Drupal is forcing you to go through you know, a major re-architecture of the technology, you know, maybe it's a time to you know, look at those other things too. Um, but you know, if, if you really wanted to go all in on sort of an incrementalist or iterative approach, um, you know, what you consider doing is, you know, trying to make the sort of the new site, which you know, like the newer version of Drupal or whatever, um, look and work as much as possible like the old site um, so that the, you know, 
back to that sort of idea of, of science of you know keeping as many things as controlled as possible and only varying as much as you have to um, you know make the variable be the underlying architecture of Drupal and the version you're on um, but try to prevent those that variable from affecting the other variables you know keep your content organized basically the same way you know keep your content types the same you know keep the sort of you know the fields the same and the templates the same and like as much as the, you know like at least when I say the same, at least in sort of presentation to the user or presentation to a search engine or something like that. Um, you know, a lot of the code under the hood might be changing, you know, with Drupal's theming layer going through changes, you know, maybe you'll have fewer divs floating around and like, you know, your site performance might improve or there might be some architectural things for administrators that you know are different. Like what used to be a taxonomy is now a content type or something. Um, but if you want, if you sort of keep the variables to a minimum on the front end for your users or for your, you know, search engines in terms of URLs, um, you know, now you're just sort of knowing like what is the effect of switching Drupal versions? Like, oh, our site, it's basically the same content. It's basically the same look and feel. It's basically the same everything. Um, but now it loads 20% faster and we're seeing higher click through rates as a result. Um, you know, that would be the thing that I would recommend doing, you know, if like your hands are tired, you've got to re-architect, you've got to rebuild. Um, you can focus on the tech part without necessarily making massive changes to the sort of end user experience. I hope that answers the question or at least gives you something to think about. Yeah, I, I don't see any other questions yet. Um, I was just going to mention to folks. Oh, yep, so Ashley says, thank you, lots to think about. Um, I, and I was just going to mention, so we'll, we'll be sharing the um, recording of this webinar um, and including some links where you can sign up with Corner Shop for some um, quick 20 minute consultant sessions. So if you have questions and you wanna talk just for 20 minutes more, we, we have those free options as well. So um, we'll be, emailing all of that to folks. Um, I'll wait just another moment for any additional questions. I think we should try to email the slide deck too, just so folks have yes. all of the slides. Sounds great. All right, well, thanks everybody for attending. I really appreciate your listening to us ramble about iterative web design and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully it's given you guys all some really excellent food for thought for whether it might fit for your organization and if it does, what some of those challenges and opportunities might be. Thank you. Thank you all. all. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs>